On to chapter three. Now, chapter three is about quantitative data. So go ahead and go back to chapter one to make sure you know, if you haven't yet, what quantitative data is. So if you know, let's proceed. With quantitative data, we want to calculate a range and the IQR. Now the IQR can be noted as Q1 to Q3, as in the distance between those. Using the four quarters on the screen, the IQR is the interquarters, as you can see right here, it is the interquarters. That's why we call it the interquartile range. It represents the middle 50% of the data, and it's merely just the span or the range of that middle 50%. That's why you'll notice the concept is coupled here with the range. It's, it's just a range. The IQR is a range just like the range. So let's calculate a few. So here we have starting salaries or prospective salaries of UT students on whether or not they've broken a bone. So we have two stacked histograms right here. Histograms are univariate quantitative displays of data. And we're just stacking two, so it's two univariate quantitative displays. With this in mind, let's go ahead and calculate the range. Now the range is simply max minus min, which is two numbers of the five number summary. So max minus min right here is $190,000. That's a big range. Going down to the other distribution, we have the same exact range, $190,000. Interesting. Now the IQR is the range of the middle 50%. And interpreting it, it would be like, the middle 50% of these students has a range of $20,000, going from a low of $40,000 at the 25th percentile to a high of $60,000 at the 75th percentile. And you'll notice here, this is the IQR right here. And in between it, we have the last number of the five number summary, we have the median. And very similar IQR down here, the range of the middle 50, oh, yeah, it's a little bit different. Oh, it's the same number actually, I stand corrected. The middle 50% of salaries that stat to one students expect to get when they graduate from college has a range of $20,000. It goes from Q1 of $50,000 to the 75th percentile, Q3, $70,000. And, you know, that is our definition right there. We also see the median is 55. And I want to note right here, the median does not have to be between Q1 and Q3. This is not always symmetric, so sometimes you see the median is not in between those perfectly. It has to be between them or on top of them, but it doesn't have to be symmetric between them. Very important point right there, because data can look a little bit weird. And you'll notice the box of the box plot over here. And yes, so that is calculating the range and the IQR right here. The next topic is when to use the mean and standard deviation versus median and IQR. And props for um, everyone who created the sheet because we actually have S in there for standard deviation. Good to know the notation. So let's go back. When should we use the mean and standard deviation? When data is symmetric. Mean and standard deviation, as you'll notice in this output, are paired together. And this data is symmetric, but there's one more requirement when data is symmetric, and we don't have outliers. So we want to see symmetric data that doesn't have outliers. The more symmetric it is and the less outliers, the better the mean is for describing the center of the data, and the better the standard deviation is for describing the spread of the data. With this in mind, this data has a lot of high outliers. And you'll notice the mean of 55,000 is a good bit higher than the median of 50,000. This all is also observable right here, that diamond, the center of it is the mean, and the line in the middle of the box plot is the median. So you can see the mean is skewed to the right because the distribution is skewed to the right. So since this distribution has some strong skew to it due to the outliers, um, we will go with the median and IQR. The median is the measure of center, and the IQR is the measure of spread. Now, it doesn't matter what I do with this last point over here. I'm going to highlight just it. This last point, if I were to make it $100 billion, it would not change the position of the median, and it would not change the position of Q1 and Q3. Because this number up here, changing it won't change these positions. This is what we like about the median and IQR. It's not impacted by outliers. Outliers can be as high or as low as they want, 
and it won't change the position of the middle numbers. So that's really great for properly describing it. In my class, I use an example where the boss is factoring in their salary and all of a sudden everyone's salaries look higher. But if you take the median, it's not going to change the average salary because the average person in the company is still making pretty much the average. It will just move over a half a position. So really no change when we put in an outlier. And that's the great thing why we love the median and the IQR. So the median and IQR, median is a measure of center. Mean is a measure of center. IQR is a measure of spread. Standard deviation is a measure of spread. Mean and standard deviation are for symmetric, unimodal data that does not have outliers. We like that. And median and IQR can handle data that has skewness, outliers, and abnormalities. So it's really good for non-normal data. Next, we need to interpret the median, mean, quartiles, IQR, range, and standard deviation. Now, each of these will have their own interpretation. The median is the 50th percentile. It is literally the 50th percentile. The mean is the average of all the observations. And an important thing to remember is, and I can't stress this enough, interpret in context of the problem. So when we're looking right here, the 50th percentile for prospective salaries for students who have not broken a bone is $50,000. It's the 50th percentile. 50% 50 of students expect to get more than this. 50% of students expect to get less than this. When we look at the mean, the average salary students report that they expect to get for students who have not broken a bone is $55,466. That is the average when we average them all together. Q1 and Q3 are respectively the same kind of interpretation as the median. 25% of students who have not broken a bone, I'm just talking about this number right here, expect to get $40,000. That means 25% of students would expect to get that or less, and 75% of students would expect to get that or more at Q3. 75% of students expect to get $60,000 or less, and 25% of students expect to get $60,000 or more. That is the interpretation for Q3. The standard deviation shows us the average spread of what's going on here if a normal model were to describe it. And I love Jump shows you some little definitions when you hover over stuff. But the standard deviation is if this data is normally distributed, the standard deviation could be used in a normal model to describe what we're, where we would expect the central 68, 95, and 99.7% of data. And it shows kind of how the data is spread out. The larger the standard deviation, the more spread and variation there is to the data. The IQR is, once again, the middle 50%. We interpreted a moment ago, but why not again? The range of the middle 50% of salaries for STAT 201 students who have not broken a bone is $20,000, going all the way from $40,000 to $60,000. And I believe that is every bit of interpretation we can do. Just interpret in context of the problem. Very, very, very important. Every time it says interpret in context, highlight that. Make sure you do it. Another area where people go short on their words is doing shape, center, spread, and unusual features. Very important to go over each one. Shape, center, spread, unusual features. And this is for a histogram. So looking back on our example histograms, we have shape. This is a unimodal histogram right here with some right skew. We have center. The center is best described by the median because of its skewness. We have spread. The spread is best described by the IQR. Unusual features, it has some outliers and it has some gaps. And I would probably name the outliers as a very high outlier at about 200,000. And I can see it over there in the five number summary. And it has other clusters of outliers, maybe at 150,000. Oh, it tells me right there. At 150,000, and I could hover over these and figure out what's going on there. That person was very precise in their salary. Kudos to them. So gaps and outliers are kind of the idea of unusual features. And we've shaped, center, spread, unusual features, and we've properly described this histogram. If I was writing it, I'd make sure to be full in my sentences, write good full sentences, and actually give the numbers. I've already described this thing quite a few times, and I would describe where the median and the IQR are and what they mean if I had to. Next, we have the relationship between a histogram box plot and stem and leaf. Now a stem and leaf lets you actually see the numbers. And it's amazing because you just have to interpret. Now this one, we have to be careful. We have to look at the key and always look at the key. 
four slash zero equals 40,000. You can notice a similar shape. The bin widths are a little bit different over here, so we're gonna see a different shape over here. So the bin widths here are 10,000 each. It looks to be 10,000, and this is just a mess over there. So this is just a histogram with the actual numbers inside of it. So you can see $50,000, $50,000, $50,000, $55,000, um, $150,000. All of these are actual real numbers. On this side, inside the leaves, the stems are just the bins. The stem is equivalent to looking down here on your histogram. So a lot of other important things we can do is we can actually get the median out of this. Now to get the median, we have to figure out what is the middle number. The middle number can be found by adding one to the total number and then dividing by two. That'll get us 17.5. So 17.5, and then we're lucky here, 17.5 is right before 18. And there are seven observations here. That just means how many observations are in there. And 11 here, there are 18 observations by this point. So this is the 18th observation, and we need the 17.5th right between these two. And since that's 55,000 and that's 55,000, we average those two together to get 55,000. So you can find the median pretty easily using a stem and leaf plot. Um, these numbers over here on this side are a great way to double check your math if you're counting along. Sometimes I'll count along, but this tells you you're at the 18th number, you're at the 25th number, 27th number, 29th, 30th, 32nd, 33rd, and 34th, because there's 34 total numbers. And once again, that formula, n plus 1 divided by 2, tells you the position of the median. So n is sample size, 34 plus 1, 35, divided by 2 is 17.5, and then I look for the 17.5th position. Stem and leaf is just a histogram that lets you see the numbers. It's, it's not a histogram, technically speaking, but I say it is like a histogram that lets you see the numbers. Great advantage is you see the numbers. Bad advantage is you see the numbers. And if there's a lot of numbers, that's a mess. So this one's not so bad. I used a small subset to help us out here. So we're down to the home stretch on the last two topics. You can identify symmetry, skewness, outliers, and gaps from histograms or stem and leaves using the same sort of techniques that we described just a moment ago. Because remember, the stem and leaf is just like the histogram. So you're looking at the same stuff. Now, I will say this. When it comes to box plots, box plots are not the best indicator of a lot of stuff. When you look at a box plot, going back to one over here, you can't really tell where a lot of things are. You get this box in the middle, and there's a lot of great graphics if you um, Google them. And what you'll notice is, is the box plot doesn't show you how much is in each bin. So looking at the box plot right there, we don't have any idea where this peak is. The peak could have been in here somewhere. You know, you can kind of see where the concentrations of data are, but it's very hard to tell where a lot of the peaks are. Box plots are not good for shape. Your best bet for shape would be the histogram or the stem and leaf. That's where you really get an idea of what's going on with the shape. Box plots are the five number summary. That's what a box plot does for you. It lets you see the five number summary, which, which is great. So for skewed distributions, it's super awesome. Calculating a median by hand and interpreting it. You, one of the best ways to calculate a median by hand is to put all the numbers in order. And remember the formula, n plus one divided by two, you're gonna find the position of that number. So if you have nine numbers, n plus 1 is 10 divided by 2. You're going to take the fifth number. And if you think about it, just you hold up your hands for a moment. If you hold up your thumb, there's four numbers before that, and then you hold up four numbers after, you can see how your thumb is in the middle of it. It's, I'm doing it now. Hopefully you are too. It's got to be the middle number. And when there's an odd amount of numbers, there is a middle number. When there's an even amount of numbers, there is no middle number, so you have to divide two numbers together. So I find the best way to calculate the median by hand is to put them all in order, very important there, and then find the middle number. And you can see it in a stem and leaf plot because it'll have them in order, so I was able to do that previously. Know what the five number summary is. Now, lots of great ways to calculate the five number summary. Um, you can do it on the TI calculator the video right there to go ahead and click on it. If you want, click on the video and go to the five number summary and learn how to do it on the TI calculator. So the five number summary is just the min, Q1, median, Q3, and the max. Calculate the mean by hand and interpreting it. 
The mean is just averaging all the values together. So you add them all up and divide by how many you added together. So interpreting it is just the average value in the distribution of blank. Make sure to put it in context and just be careful. Don't make a calculation error. Variance is standard deviation squared. So if we just took this little s up here and we squared it, that would be standard deviation squared, which is variance. Uh, a lot of times we don't like to work in variance because variance is squared units, and we'd rather work with standard deviation. That does it for chapter three. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.